instructions and there's just no, there's not right. a lot you can do about no, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all right. That's uh, we just move that thing around to where it, that reflection is not in there. And, and as the out. sun goes down, that'll that window will get dark mm -hmm. too. Sun is so late going down these days. So. Mm -hmm. This is Interview with Margaret Abney, August 25th, 1992, 200 Carolina Avenue, Park West Condo, Winter Park, Florida. Interviewer Nancy Aseco, cameraman Robert Gilbert, equipment camera Sony BVP50, Beta SP recorder Sony BVW35, audio on channels 2 and 4, copyright Brevard County Historical Commission, 1992, Margaret Abney, tape one. Okay, we'll start with the beginning. All right. Where were you born and when? I was born in Coco, January 11th, 1898. When did your family first come to Brevard? Well, my mother was born in Brevard County in LaGrange. My father came in 1884. July the 4th, he landed back of Rock Ledge. And he and his brother both came, and they uh, homesteaded on the island. They came to Florida from Scotland, Glasgow, Scotland, on account of their aunt, their sister having uh, been married, um, married and lived up in Palatka. Her name was Wallace, Margaret Wallace. And her husband died, and she had a little boy. So they came over to um, the United States to take her back to Scotland. And my Uncle Tom wrote to my father. He came first, and my he wrote back. He said, I think you would like it over here. Come over. And so he landed over here and came down the St. John's River and landed back of Rock Ledge on July the 4th of 1884. What a trip that must have been. Yeah. And he was born in Scotland, I think it was 1853. I've got it down somewhere, but I think that was when he was born. Where was the homestead in Merritt Island? Over on Merritt Island, uh, uh, up north of Merritt Island. He had, a hundred, I think, 125 acres, what they did then. And But his father had sent them money to help buy it, and they could get off of the land and go get, find jobs. So they did that, and uh, my father went up as far as Titusville, and then his brother, uh, well, he ended up, so he never married the other one, Uncle Tom, but he worked for the P&O Steamship Company for a long time. He was a purser. He liked that. But my father, he just, worked around, he kept books for people, and then he worked, um, started working for the um, fruit company, the Indian River Pineapple and Fruit Growers Association, with Mr. E.P. Pache. And uh, he worked for them for 19 years, until their son Arthur began to be a man, and could be able to take the work. And so my father quit working for them, and he ran for clerk of the circuit court. He ran in 1913, or I guess he was running in 1912. What was his name? James Finley Mitchell. And he was the second clerk of the circuit, clerk of the circuit court of Brevard County. Mr. A. E. Stewart was the one that was first. And uh, I have a picture, and I get maybe some people have seen it hanging up in the courthouse. I've never seen it hanging there, but I've got a copy of it with all the clerks of the court. Mm -hmm. And he's in it, and uh, but he, d uh, he he had it for eight years. He didn't run the last because he had the flu mm. when they had the bad case of the flu, and he never felt too good after that. He died in 1924, uh, I think it was. Mm. I'm thinking that because I've got it written down somewhere, but I'm I think it was 24 that he died. But uh, your uncle worked on the steamships. Uh, the P&O Steamship Company. He was a pressure on that. And went from I think they were came from Key West to Florida and all kind of things like that. Tell us a little bit about what the steamships did 
Right. Well, now, I don't know so much about what they did, but I know that they went up and down the river, and I know that the mail was carried up and down the river in boats. And, uh, but uh, I guess they carried passengers back and forth. My father wrote a little piece about going down to Miami in a boat, just a, I guess it, I guess it was a steamboat. They didn't row it. <laughs> and uh, he taught me how to row a boat, row a canoe, how to work the paddles and everything. So every time I see anybody rowing a boat, I see if they're doing it correctly. <laughs> but uh, we had, we never had a launch, but we had boats with Papa. My father, when they uh, was working for the fruit company, and uh, we had a grist grove over there, and then we bought a, another a house and some more land to grow, but extra place. And so, well, I don't know whether you want to tell me all about that, but whether you want me to, but they bought a, in 1905, they bought a home on uh, Indian River Drive, which used to be Palmetto Avenue. The Indian River Drive used to be. And my mother was one that she made, the, she might have been others, but she wrote and tried to and asked the people to call it Indian River Drive instead of Palmetto Avenue. And, uh, but he bought this house, it was an old, old house, in 1905. And I can remember, I was seven years old then, and I can remember when we lived there and we it was on the river. And it's still there and my nephew has it now. Which, where is, what's the uh, It's uh, 307 Indian River Drive, the north part. And then I had some, my Aunt Maggie had a house back of it and some land, and I owned that back there. I've sold it to Mitchell. He likes property. And <laughs> well, so you say your, your mother was born. She was born in LaGrange in 1871. And her father was <clears throat> came down right after the war between the states her father came down and uh, then after a while he um, that was W.S. Norwood he uh, some another man that came with him Mara but I don't know just whether he was in this with him but he had a, a horse and wagon and they used to carry the mail and passengers also over from uh, the river what it is uh, St. John's Saint, well, it was the St. John's over there, but the lake. Uh, Poinsett. Poinsett. Mm -hmm. But anyway, from they had a mail drive, a mail route, and they and they'd bring passengers over in the wagon and they And when Mama's people came over, my father, my grandfather, was then driving that, and he brought uh, Mama's mother and their family down. And uh, they landed um, out in the Grange where somebody had already bought the land, some of their cousins or something that were in the other part of the state somewhere. But anyway, he saw my mother on there. Uh, no, my, my mother's mother. She came, they're the ones that came out of the wall between the states. And he said to himself, I'm gonna marry that girl. And <laughs> within a year he had. <laughs> and uh, well, that was my mother's. Mother. And uh, Mama was the oldest child of that family of 13 children. Did you hear any stories about what life was like in those days? Oh, yes. My mother has diaries. I tried to put my hand on that diary, and then she's got diaries, and I've got the diaries. And It was uh, life simple, but they seemed to enjoy it somehow or other. Mama used to tell about a mule named Dolly that when she was a child, I think some of them had walked the thing down from South Carolina. They came to South Carolina. But she was riding in a wagon. And I, she had the correct name on there, but you remember, if, you, if you've ever seen a wagon, how they've hitched it to the things and then part of the things go up. Well, she was riding or something, and one of them flew back and knocked her off the <laughs> wagon because somehow when they unhitched it from the horse or cow, mule. But... Um, Anyway, I've got a lot of stories. My father used to, on the island, there was a Scotsman that came over that wrote things and sent back to Scotland about Florida. And he'd get my father to write the things for him while he went around having a good time. 
and Papa would write the articles for him to send back to Glasgow in the paper, a, a magazine. What were the stories about? Well, just about what the island was like and everything. And when my father was running for the clerk of the circuit court, we rented the house to somebody else in Coco and went over and lived on the property on the Grove. And uh, well, that was when I was in the eighth grade. And we had to ride down to um, Courtney to go to school. And we had a buggy and a horse, Gallagher. <laughs> and we'd come to one corner. I don't know, it was about five miles. I just don't know exactly how far it was from our grove down to where the schoolhouse was. But there was one corner that the mosquitoes decided they were going to eat you up. And we kept coats in the back of the, the little, we had a, in the back of the car, boat on my land. The way the boogie, it, it went up and kind of like a car is now. You just put it down, shut it up, and we kept coats in there. When we came to this corner, where we knew the mosquitoes were going to take over, we'd put on heavy coat to go around that corner, and then you know, make the horse fly as fast as he could. And we unhitched the horse and tied him to a tree and went to school, and we went home from there. But I just did that in eighth grade. But I started school in Coco. You want me to keep on? Yeah, well, this all sounds real good. Let me, uh... You better give me something else to talk. Yeah, well... My first school teacher was Miss Stella Mims in Coco. And, uh, when I was in the promo. And, uh, Miss Stella Mims, her folks... Well, she did, too, from, from... They lived in Mims, north of Titusville. And... What was the schoolhouse like? The one on the island, uh was just a one-room schoolhouse, and there wasn't too many pupils in there. I don't remember any of the t pupils, but I do remember the uh, um, teacher's name, Miss Gertrude Stewart. But that's when I was in the eighth grade. But my one in Coco was Miss Stella Mims, the teacher, was in the Coco school. And uh, I went there till I was in the well, eighth grade. I just had to go over there because we went to the house and went over there then. So part of my eighth grade was in Coco and part... What was a school day like when you went to school in Cocoa? What would it be like? Well, it was uh, I guess like any other school, but I can't remember much of it. The one part that I always laugh about is Miss Stella Mims. I think she taught all of our my sisters in, from the in the first grade, and it might have been first, second, third, because I don't remember the second grade teacher. But um, and that was uh, in the primer. The only thing that I can always remember about that school was we used to have to march and we had to exercise. But uh, I shouldn't maybe tell this, but it's so funny, I've always laughed about it. There was a boy that walked back of me and we had to lean up and down to exercise. <coughs> and I would always didn't like to lean up and down in front, back in front of him. His name was Oscar Rouse. And I'm never, I'd like to know what happened to Oscar. The only thing I've heard about was out um, in Oviedo, Oviedo, uh, there was a boy out there named Rouse, and I always wondered if that was Oscar, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> so I can't remember much reading and writing and arithmetic. I can remember those. But I better stop on that subject. Okay, well, we'll stop there. We'll go I on. went back, I stopped it. Well, anyway, when the eighth grade, that was when my father was elected. So then we went to Titusville. I finished the eighth grade up in Titusville. Okay. Um, you told me one mosquito story. I bet you've got a, a couple more you can tell us. How did people deal with all the mosquitoes? Slept on a mosquito net at night everywhere from Jacksonville to um, Coco, Titusville, anywhere. All the bedrooms had a mosquito net over the top. And going out, out every door, well I guess everybody did, we did, we had a little dish of insect powder. You lit that insect powder and let it smell. That would kill the mosquitoes and put near you too. But <laughs> anyway, you smell better than having mosquitoes. But uh, and then they had mosquito brushes and um, had things to switch them away. You know, they make some kind of a switch out of. I just can't remember. They made out of um, a little old stuff that grows palm. It's not palm trees, but. Palmetto little ones when they're small. 
the people used to make palmetto hats out of those and wide puffy brush of hats and things. Did and you have smudge pots? And oh yeah, we had smudge pots in the side and outside and up and down. But, uh, and you had to have screens on your window so they wouldn't come in if you wanted any air. And, uh, but the mosquitoes, they were terrible. Sometimes they were so big and so <laughs> other times they were little, you know, and they always bit you. And, uh, but everybody had the insect powder. I don't know what else they had besides insect powder, but I can remember the insect powder. Every now and then I want to buy a little if I could find it and just burn it just to see what it smells like. See if it smells as bad as I thought it did. <laughs> but uh, I can remember some good things. And, uh, well, I can't remember bad things when I don't remember anything bad. I, I remember the children. We had a good time. Let's cut for a second. Tell us a little bit about the early postal history. Well, now I don't know too much about the early postal history, except my, I don't remember where my grandfather was, but uh, my mother's father was a postmaster a little while up in Titusville, or I think it was Titusville, either men's, but Titusville, I think. What was his name? W. S. Norwood. He was postmaster up there a while. He was also a legislator, a legislator a while, but um, my second husband was a postmaster, Lawrence Abney, <clears throat> but he, uh, his mother was a postmaster before him, I don't remember that, but she was a postmaster up at City Point. And uh, then when she uh, resigned or whatever, Lawrence took it over, and he was postmaster till, till they did away with the postmaster in City Point a little while before he died, I guess it was. But uh, I knew uh, when he, when I was married to him, he was postmaster, and so once in a while I would try to help put the mail around. I learned one or two funny little things in the postmaster. If you got a letter addressed, <laughs> I want not to tell this, if you got a letter addressed to somebody that didn't even live there, you just kept it <laughs> till they came. <laughs> And as for their mail, <laughs> there were different reasons for doing that. It was mostly the girl and the boy writing a letter or something. <laughs> I learned that little bit. And um, but I had, didn't really work in the as a, as a worker. I worked a lot of different places. Well, tell but us not. again about how they would ship the well, mail. Well, they go with the mail. <clears throat> you'd go out to the train and get it coming off the. Well, now that City Point was the only one that I really knew how they did it, uh, but they'd put the, hang the bag on a pole out there off the train that was going by, and that's where. And then you'd go out there, you knew when the train was coming, and uh, they went out and took it off the pole and brought it into the post office. That's how they did that, and uh, that's all that I really know. But that's what they did when I, Lawrence and I married in '39. He died in '67, but he. Uh, the post office shut several years before he was, and then the post office was closed down out there. They didn't need it. And they used to use uh, boats, I guess, in the early days. Oh, they used, yeah, they used to deliver the mail or come down the river in a boat. I guess they did that. And uh, and people used to come from over on the island in a boat to the back of, well, the store at City Point, the back of it was on the rubble. And they'd come up in a boat. I can remember coming back there with somebody before I ever had met Lawrence or anything else. Um, I didn't know. I just knew I was coming to Avenue Store. Somebody was coming there to buy groceries or something before I ever even knew him. Okay. But uh, I don't really know too much about. I've worked a lot of places, but never in a post office except when I was married and just for fun was there. Well, talk a little bit about the businesses. Well, grocery stores were nice, and they delivered groceries. And uh, before telephones, I guess you went to the store and got your groceries. Vegetables and things used to come down. There used to be a, a colored man that had would have a wagon up down the island, I remember, and they had sometimes in cocoa. And he'd have vegetables in the wagon, and he'd come up and down the road calling out what he had. You'd hear him coming. 
and uh, Dennis Sawyer, I think, was one of the colored men's name that used to do it. And uh, but after a while, when you got tel after you got telephones, I can remember our first telephone. You'd call up, and then your grocery were delivered. My mother, I don't think my mother ever went after went to a grocery store to get things. She or maybe she did when she was a little girl, but not as long as I can remember. And after my first husband died, I came back over from Winter Park to Cocoa to live with my mother for ten years while I was married again. But she uh, always called up. I can remember the first telephone that we had there. And they were one that you wound it up on the wall to ring your number. And then you'd call, uh, you didn't ring it up to call your number, except to call, they'd call it, uh, a girl at the other end would answer the telephone. Number, please. And you'd give her the number, 29J or something like that. And she'd ring the number for you. That's the way you answer the telephone. But that was quite a thing to get the telephone. And I remember, you want to ask me a question about lights? Yes. Well, for a long time it was just lanterns, you know. And lanterns for outside and uh, oil lamps for inside. You had to shine them, or oh, whatever you call them. <laughs> the, what do you call them? The, oh, excuse me. Well, shine the um, glass that was on the... I've got an old lamp back of that thing over there. But then I broke the chimney. Chimney. I broke the chimney coming over. I lost it. I haven't seen it since I came over here. That's the way to move, lose things. And you just get moved and you clean house. I haven't moved for a good while now, so I haven't got rid of all my junk. <laughs> but anyway, um, that was kind of interesting. But anyway, the oil. And then I can remember, after a while, we had some kind of a lamp, and I've been trying to think about what that lamp was. It was a funny kind of a thing. It wasn't, I don't, I don't remember putting any gas in it, but it was a white thing that, um, I don't know, I've been telling people it looked like an ice cream cone or something. But anyway, we had one hanging up on the wall. But the, lamp, the oil lamps, I can remember those very well. And uh, I can't exactly remember when the first electricity came in, but I can remember the oil lamps. I was, they always kind of interested me. You had to keep the chimney shining, and that was a good job. And, <laughs> and the lantern, I had an old lantern I gave to somebody. I like that lantern because you carry them and swing them around. And, uh, but just, uh, yeah. Ask me a question. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm trying to figure the the right question to ask after this. Um, you uh, you saw lights and and uh, power come in. I guess the ice. Oh, the ice men. Yes, they'd come down the street hollering ice, uh, ice man, <laughs> and uh, we knew when it was coming for some reason. We could hear him coming, and then you bought the ice. Well, in Cocoa, they had an ice house. Out there, and you could go out there if you wanted to. After you had a buggy or wagon or a horse and buggy or something, and buy ice by the pound or the chunk. And then they had refrigerators, and you buy the ice and put fill it up. And it was very nice. You had a chunk, and then you chopped it off with a chopper. And, but uh, I can remember that before the uh, before the electric ice boxes. I can remember that. I guess the ice factories came partly that were for the fish. The they had an ice factory from the what? For the fishing. In yes, I guess they did. But they used to have an ice house down in Cocoa, and I can't remember right now who that, that was, but you could go down to the ice house, and they had a walk up on the blank where you walked, and um, then you'd go in there and buy your ice and bring it out. I don't know whether they sold it by the pound, I think is the way they sold it. But uh, I thought I kind of liked the icebox. And uh, something cool in the hot weather. Something cool, yes. I liked it for the cool ice. You put fish on it, and well, anyway, the ice was good. I, that's one of my memories of the ice. Okay, let me just check and see how far along. We've got a few more minutes on this tape. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the railroad coming through. 
Well, now that's what I like is railroads. Because I've got over there a, a sheet that somebody brought to me because it was asking me a question about it. It was published in eight, May of 1898, the year I was born. And I was going on a trip to, to Jacksonville. And it's got on that first page, it got more on that first page, which I've got May of 1898. And my father and mother and baby Margaret born. But it didn't say where I was born, but it was May, and so I was just born in January, so I was just a baby. And that was my first ride on a train. So we had passed through house, Mr. and Mrs. E. P. Pache, and uh, well, he was the one my father worked for 19 years at the Pineapple Indian Pineapple and Orange and Pineapple Growers Association. My father used to buy pineapples up and down the coast, and then we'd go to Jacksonville every summer during the pineapple season, and that we so we went on a train, and so from the time I was born, every year for. Well, for about, so Papa quit working for the fruit company just before he was, uh, when he was around, 1912. But before my mother and he were married, he worked for the company, the fruit company. But uh, that was my first train ride, and I said, that proved I was on a train. But everybody's fussing about the train, making so much noise, you know, I can hear them from here. In fact, the railroad track's right out there somewhere, for they went apart. Railroad. And one day in Coco, everybody's fussing about the noise that people down in Melbourne, that they didn't like it, um, the horn, they, when they blew so much. And so I went down to the city hall one night, I said they were having a meeting. And I got up and I was sitting on the back seat and I, the, the woman that was the head of the, up there on the, well, she was one of the leaders of the thing. She she could see that I was happy every time anybody got up and said that let the trains blow the horn. So she beckoned for me to come up. So I got up there in front of everybody and I said, well, if it wasn't for the trains, there wouldn't be any Florida. I said, the trains brought everybody down to Florida <laughs> on the train. And uh, But I, think, I said, I like to hear them blow, and I like it here. I learned something on a train not long ago, my children. I said, I want to take one more train ride. So I went up on the Amtrak to Georgia to visit my youngest son. And uh, I, every now and then I heard that horn blow, toot, toot, toot. I said, what is that thing blowing four times? Every now and then it moans out. And I, so I looked out the window. And every time it would do these four, well, I like to imitate it, but I'm not now. It was a crossing, a road crossing. So I listen here at night when I hear the trains go over. And I hear them say, toot, toot. <laughs> As they, they're coming to a crossing, but they blow it kind of softly. But anyway, they kept on blowing them, I think, down there in Melbourne. I'm not sure, but they do in Cocoa, and they blow them here. Can you tell me something about the pineapple business? Well, my father used to go up and down the court, and we used to always have, a, when we went to Jacksonville, and that's when they, they shipped the pineapples through Jacksonville then. And, um, we always had a crate of pineapples in our house, a long crate, like and they were little pineapples, and they were so good. I just loved pineapples. And after we'd get through those crates, we, <coughs> four of us, we'd play out in the yard, make us a house, and build us a house out in the backyard with pineapple, with pineapple boxes. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I don't think a lot of people know that pineapples uh, ever grew in Florida. Oh well, I think most everybody does. They up and down the down to, I think, you know how far my father, we used to go down to buy the things, but they grew them for a while, and they, I think they grew some on the island, too. Well, anyway, on this front page I've got of the paper, nearly every column's got something about pineapples in it. And it was quite a business. And after my father quit, and he ran for clerical court, then I think Arthur Pache managed the office, but my father managed it for 19 years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Okay. I love pineapples. I still like them. In fact, I've got caps on two of my front teeth, and uh, the rest of my teeth are mine. But I think I did it from eating all those pineapples. <laughs> Cut.
Interview with Margaret Abney, August 25th, 1992, at 200 Carolina Avenue, Park West Condo, Winter Park, Florida. Interviewer Nancy Aseco, cameraman Bob Gilbert, equipment camera Sony BVP50, Beta SP recorder Sony BVW35, audio on channels 2 and 4. Copyright Brevard County Historical Commission 1992, Margaret Abney, Tape 2. Go. Okay, if you could tell us about your memories of when the stock market crashed and the depression hit. Well, I can um, remember when it was. It was soon after my, um, about the time my <coughs> husband died, right after. I forgot, well, he died in 29, and um, I can remember when the bank closed, I can remember that um, somebody from the bank, he he did work in the bank, he worked in the bank in Miami, he worked in the bank of Titusville, and he worked in the Barnett Bank when we first married. So he'd been in the bank business quite a while, and, but he wasn't then because he came down to Titusville and went in the real estate business. and. Uh, so this one of the bankers, I don't know who it was, he came over to visit at night. I was up in Titusville. And uh, he says, uh, the banks aren't going to open in the morning. And I knew that part. That's all I knew. And that's about as much as I knew too much. But it seemed to kept on going, got worse and worse, you know. And, and uh, he had been. A, he got in. The, was in the real estate business and making a little money. He got out of post out of the banking business because he started making some money down the home. He bought land, and went up and down from Miami to Titusville. And uh, then I can't just remember all about the banks closing and everything, but it, I can remember after they'd closed. And it kind of confused me because I know that uh, he when he died, I got a little insurance and uh, some other insurance that he had, good big thing. He had borrowed money on that insurance from a bank. I never hear, heard anything about that money afterwards. I don't know what happened to it. And quite a bit I didn't, but uh, he got a little money and I tried to, I had the little bit that I got I got in the right place for some accidental reason. But then after a while, when the, the depression was on, and you couldn't buy sugar without a little piece of paper, and you couldn't buy this, and, and when I uh, started working over at the base, it was still the depression going on, and you couldn't uh, buy gas unless you carried people with you. You had to be, have about five people in the car with you to keep it up. And when I worked over at um, NASA, I had to pick up people in my car to buy gasoline. I had to have them riding with me. So I had uh, a couple and then a girl. That would have been the, the Banana River Naval Air Station? Uh-huh, Banana River Naval Air Station. I worked in the A&R department. And uh, I got up to be uh, the manager of that part department before I left. I worked on a whole lot of command, different commanders. And that's when the war, World War II came on. I can remember that part. But uh, all the little cards you have to have, had to have, I've got one. You had to have some card to get across the bridge, and I don't know what it looks like. Well, it was really kind of confining, but I can't say that I knew the best about it. But I didn't suffer too much from it, I don't think. I guess I suffered more than I didn't know I was suffering. <laughs> but um, I don't know that I'm very good on uh, that. I'll think about a whole lot after a while, but not right now. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what it was like in Brevard County during World War II. Yes, I can do that because when my, my young son was in the Army. And uh, I used to be a spotter, an airplane spotter. And uh, I'd get up, go up there in City Point and get, go out on the dock and sit there. And then when a plane went over, and we somehow or other knew what kind of a plane it was going over, 
and how I was going, we'd, we'd call up. Every time a plane came over, and I did that for quite a while. It was fun. But after I went to work, then I went to work over at the base, and um, so I didn't do it anymore. But they changed the spotting place from on the dock, on the top of the church across there up in City Point of Sharps. There's an old church. I think that's the church is still there, and they built a little tower up there. I never got to spot while I was up there, but I was at this airplane spot. But then I went over to the base and worked, and uh, my, my youngest son was in the service then. He was a foot soldier, and uh, he was reported missing while I was working over there. And uh, when I went to one of the mosquito, not the mosquito beaters, but over at the base, I go to that uh, reunion they have at the base, and one of the men over there remembered the day I, the day I had got this telegram from Jimmy. But it was funny getting that telegram that he was missing in action. I, it was Thanksgiving, you know, they changed the day of Thanksgiving sometime about in there. And, uh, and so I asked to get off, and I wanted to celebrate the real Thanksgiving. So I said, may I get off this day? So I was off and I was at home, and I saw this telegraph boy coming up the road to my house, the driveway, a little ways from the rubble. And I said, uh-oh, everything scared you during the war, you know. And when it came, I had a telegram saying he was missing in action. And then the next day I got a letter from, um, or I think it was a letter, maybe it might have been a phone call, from a girl down in Rock Ledge, Mary Lou Shepard. And she said, I don't believe he's missing in action because I got a, tele a letter today from him. It was from a hospital. And he'd gone to the hospital. And I don't know to this day if they got him mixed up, but I got a load of clothes from his war, of war clothes and everything they said were his from the Army. I got, um, but then after a good while, after all that had gone on, I got some kind of a telegram that he wasn't missing in action. He was in the hospital and he just had a little wound in his leg. I remember that part about it. And I was working over there at the base then in the a &R department. But I think I've missed this up, this question. No, that's very pertinent. It, it, yeah. it reminds us, I yeah. think, mm -hmm. about what it must have been like. Yeah. So when I went back, everybody, one thing about working in the a &R department, there used to be one of the officers out of the, the part that I worked in, that's where they mended the uh, parachutes and things out in the back. <laughs> there used to be one officer that came through there, and I guess he was kidding and everything. But he, every time he walked through the office, Heil Hitler. <laughs> and I said, I don't know to this day why he was Heil Hitler all the way through there. <laughs> but I, that's what he'd say coming through the office. Mm. But I think Commander Aiken was the first I, uh, commander that I can remember. But I worked under about five or six different commanders. They were always transferred to some other place, you know, a bigger place or something. But I enjoyed it there in the A&R department. And, uh, what is A&R? Assembly and Repair. Mm -hmm. And that's where they repaired the planes and everything. My sister worked in there a while, and I would go in and uh, take dictation. I worked in the secret part of the office for New Pasco. And I don't know got new many secrets though. But anyway, I would go in and take down the dictation and I would come out and my sister would uh, take my dictation and type a letter. She could read my short hair. And, um, but uh, anyway, it's assembly and repair. It seems as if almost everyone in Brevard was involved in, in the war as if the, the front line was was along the coast there. Yeah, it seems like it was, uh huh. It was. I, I think it was. Now this little thing that I go to the over there at the uh, they have a every year they have a meeting. I didn't go last year at the uh, base. And I've got a book it, I think it's over there. And my name is they got all the people that work there. And my name is the first one up there, Abney. Because mm. <laughs> it starts with an A. <laughs> a B. Yeah, A B, yeah. <laughs> What about the social life and entertainment? What did y'all do <coughs> for fun? Danced. Danced. That was a, that's what I liked the best with dances. Well, we danced on Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, Halloween, any time there was a holiday or something like that. Both my husbands were good dancers. 
My first husband went to school up in uh, Winston, Salem, New, not Winston, Salem, Winston. Went, oh, I get everything wrong, but he was in Massachusetts. Is that what it was? But anyway, he went to school in Massachusetts, right near Boston. And he'd always learn a new dance up there, and then he'd come down, and, and one of them was uh, the dip. And every time he came home, we'd, he'd show me a new dance. But uh, I liked to dance. Tell me about the dances. Where were they held? Well, they were held at different halls. In Coco, the um, Elks Club used to have dances. Some they'd have down at the Indian River Hotel. And, um, well, just different places. But uh, the ones at the Elks Club, they nearly always had a good dance there. I went there with my first, the second husband was an Elk. And uh, between cards, and he played cards there, and I danced when the dancers came. <laughs> but he liked to play cards down there at the Elks Club. And who would provide the music? Well, we'd have, once in a while, they had good orchestras come through there. There's one that I can never remember just who it was. It was a good, one of the famous kind of bands that came through there, and I can never, I want to meet somebody that was at that dance, but I can't remember anybody was there that's alive. <laughs> I, said, I said, in my life, I always liked the older people because I was blown to two or three organizations, uh, not political, um, patriotic. They both saw the P, don't know. <laughs> but anyway, and I said, they were all older, a lot of them older than I, most of them were, because I joined, I've been, I've been a DAO for 70 years. And, uh, but I said, everybody older than I am are dead now. There's nobody left. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I liked older people. Well, tell me about when you got ready for a dance, what kind of dress would you wear? Oh, I spent more money on dresses uh, than anything else. I'd rather have a good-looking dance dress than... Uh, so everybody kind of dressed up, put on their best dress, and they wear long dresses, whether people were wearing short or whatever, but they had a long dress on. I've got one that I wore so long ago, it's terrible. It's a white dress with a shiny top. Uh, you know, things on there to make it shine. And I've still got that dress, <laughs> and I ought to throw it away, but I can't do it. And uh, But um, I don't know. Over on the island, I've got a picture that was in the little paper they published over there at um, uh, on the island. And, but it's got the names of all of us. And it was the Orlando Social, not the Orlando Social, but the uh, Indianola Social Club. And nearly everybody in the picture, I've got three of my sisters are in it, and and uh, the teacher was in it. Rem, uh, her, te uh, her name, I've got her little na her name in a thing. And But anyway, they've got me, my sister as I am, and then I'm where I'm sitting is next to Charles Reed. He's the one that put it in there. And uh, the paper, you know, when you put a, p I don't know how the names got wrong, but my sister sat in there and they got my name under it. And then I'm sitting next to Charlie. But uh, anyway, uh, we dan learned to dance over there. There's a girl, oh, right this minute. Her name, I know it just as well as I know my own, but she lived over there. I came over and visited somebody on the island. And, uh, well, what other kind of holiday things would you do? Oh, May, May dances. They had a Maypole dance. They went around a Maypole, you know. I think they quit having May Day dances because they were kind of like Russia or something. I don't know, but May Day. <laughs> you couldn't celebrate, but we always had May Day. And the picnics, and they went down the, there in Coco, where there's a hotel now, but it, they had a clubhouse there, a wooden clubhouse. And I've got two or three things my mother wrote up for the paper. And, to Jacksonville and told everybody that was at the dance. And, and that's when it was her age dancing. I would, just went to look on and I wasn't much a, wasn't old enough to do that. Do you but, remember the Indian River Orange Jubilee? Yeah, I can remember that, uh-huh. They had different things, but some of that I was interested in part of it and I, I just can't remember a whole lot about the Jubilee, but I can remember that. Were there dramatic productions and theater groups? Yeah, when I went to school there in Coco, um, there used to be shows coming on. They put on a show and they'd come to the opera house. They call it was over the the post office was there, and then up to that top was what they call the opera house. And there's good shows would come through there, plays would come through, and then the school would put on little things sometime too. And uh, one of the teachers was uh, Miss Bingham. I think she used to help in those kind of things, but uh, 
we used to call out when we saw Miss Bingham coming. She wasn't one of my teachers. She, we'd always say, here comes Bingham in a hobble skirt. It was about the year that people were in hobble skirts. <laughs> we had, I think Miss Bingham must have worn one of them. <laughs> my first, well, I told you my first school teacher was Miss Stella Mims. Mm. Uh, Do you remember the circus and tent shows coming? Yes, I can remember them coming, yeah. And then up at Jacksonville, they used to have, uh, I remember them coming through there, and they, uh, I can remember looking through something and seeing the Chinese and the Japanese. I'd never seen them before, and they would have had something in the show, doing the show. And uh, they'd come through Coco and Titusville, and put up their tent, and they would go see them in a tent. And I can remember that. Um, but uh, I try not to say, yeah, I ought to say yes. <laughs> I've got two or three things I'm trying to break myself of, and um, oh. but I haven't done it yet. One, I look at other people say okay, and everybody says okay, you know, and you know, and I try to keep from saying that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you must remember when the radio first came in. Oh boy, do I remember that? Yes, yeah, and I think the first radio that I really had was. Uh, when we went over to, um, I first moved over to Orlando in 26. I think that was the first radio that we had. And that was when I was married then, I was married. And I used to listen to the things on the radio talk shows all the time. And what I can remember listening to the most was Amos and Andy. <laughs> I love to hear them. <laughs> and, uh, but I can remember the radio. And I had my TV, I never did get TVs till later on, and I think that was, um, I think I must have gotten my first really have a radio in my, I mean a TV in the house. I think it was in 39 or something like that, but I might have had one before, but I don't remember that. Okay. But, uh, and movies came to town, I guess. Yep, silent movies. They were silent. And uh, I can remember the one down at Coco, and then I, when I was first married in 1920 in Jacksonville, we used to go, <laughs> before my first child was born, I, we used to go to the movies to get cool because they had a, they didn't have any air conditioner. We didn't, I don't think anybody did much. Had open windows. But we'd go to the movie. I didn't care what the movie was because they had all the cool air coming from behind the curtain up in the front. And they put the air out back there to pull the curtains out and everything, but I spent most of 1921 in the movies <laughs> trying to get cool. <laughs> oh, Lord. There I remember streetcars. I'm Jacksonville. I like streetcars. I can still hear the bells ringing on a streetcar. And you're not asking me about that, though. Well, not No, not I think you better stop jabbering, we'll yeah. stop about Jacksonville. Yeah, we we'll won't get up there. Which of the early businesses do you recall in mm -hmm. the... Brevard area. Well, when my papa was in the fruit office, I just thought everybody had an office, I guess, and that was that. But when I grew a little larger and went to Jacksonville, I can remember once or twice, they, they moved the office from old Jacksonville over to South Jacksonville, and I'd go across the ferry and maybe sometimes take the mail and get the mail back. And just as a kid, I just did it for fun from the office over there. But What uh, about, where did you get most of your staples and perishables and things when you were in From Coco. the store, and down in Coco. And, oh, excuse me, in Coco, I think, it, well, I, it's Fields, I think it was in the Fields. It was, the store was named Field, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, Do you remember the early doctors and dentists? Yeah, the doctor that brought me was Dr. Hewlett. And uh, then there was Dr. Holmes. And uh, those are the ones that were both down in Coco. And they both traveled up and down the coast to go on the train or the boat because there weren't many doctors. And they, but they both, um, Dr. Holmes lived up north in Sharps, and then he had a home later on, on the island. Dr. Hewlett had a house there in Coco, had a pretty home right down there. Right, It's gone now with the tennis courts down there, and, uh, but it's right across from where the Porsche house is now, right with Dr. Hewlett. I've got a picture of the of the house, somewhere in my pictures and fence over there, Miss Allie Hewlett. And what about the, the dentist, was, wasn't there a Yeah, dentist, uh, Dr. Daniels was my dentist over there in Coco. 
And then later on, he had a son that turned into a dentist, and he was in Orlando. I went over to Orlando, and, and uh, when I lived there, it was uh, Lil and Daniel. He had a daughter, Dorothy, I knew. Do you remember any of the lawyers that... Uh well, I didn't have much doings with doctors till later on. One was Shepherd, I think, that only. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Let's see. Were you or any of your family really involved in hunting or fishing? No, Mr. Brady was. Mr. My father-in-law, he hunted. Every year we had a turkey. Thanksgiving was a wild turkey. He'd go out and get a wild turkey. But I don't know if my father ever did either one. I remember the fish I used to eat mostly was a mullet, fried mullet. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I don't think it mullets as good as they used to be, but they were good then. <laughs> Mutts and mullet and grits. I still like grits. I have my nanny and Rhea cook some grits every once in a while if I want something real good. I just look at grits with butter on them. Where would you get the mullet? The mullet? Well, used to get them out of the Indian River. I'd buy them at the fish house, so I never fished. I tried to fish once. I had a fishing pole, but I think I caught one fish in my life. And that took so long to catch him, I didn't care for that. <laughs> I was not a fisherman. But uh, we had a neighbor there in Coker when we were just little. Out. Like I said, in 1905 when we bought the house on the river, and I was seven years old. We had a neighbor that came down from New York every year, and they had a boat right next to us in the dock, Mr. Snyder, Mr. B.C. Snyder. And uh, so we enjoyed that. There were a lot of Northerners that would come down for the, the season. Yes. Even a long time ago, I guess. Yeah, there was a lot down. They came down to Rock Ledge, and there were a lot of little children. There was one, Lears, Lillian Lears was one of the girls, and, and another little girl, I forgot now which one it was, we used to brag she came from Michigan. And so I would say, well, that, my father came to Scotland. So I would have to say my father came to Scotland. Otherwise, we were all crackers. And uh, <laughs> and I would talk about Scotland. Oh, she says, that's, will you pass by Scotland to get to Michigan? <laughs> so she could try to get the best of me. I said, well, maybe there was a town named Scotland, but I didn't know it. I said, well, it was across the ocean to go to Scotland. <laughs> Oh, Lord, my father used to. He spent three years in South America before he came to. Well, he went back to Scotland from there. He worked for an uncle down there that was in the woolen business. Hmm. And he then he went back home. His mother died young, and but uh, he spent three years down there. So he'd sit up and tell us stories at night. And, hmm. and we'd all sit around and listen to Papa tell us wild stories, whatever they were. Yeah. But, uh, he was the clerk of the circuit court. I've got his picture. Did you ever see the picture of the clerks in the courthouse and the Titus fell? He's the second one over. To me, he's the best looking one on there. He's got a mustache. <laughs> where, would the, uh, where would the Yankees stay when they came down? But let me tell you, did you see that thing in the paper the other day? Are you a bubble, a Yankee, or a cracker? Or are you a southerner or a northerner? And I said, well, I'm, I'm a cracker, but I never cracked the whip. And otherwise, I'm a southerner. But I like to tell people I'm a cracker, but you know where the cracker name came from. You've heard that. It's because the people cracked the whip for, for the cattle and things. For the thing. And so that's where the cracker name came from. But the bubber, I don't know where that came from. Not B-U-B-B-A. I never heard that, what it was. But I like to say I'm a cracker, but I, I don't really consider myself a cracker. <laughs> But my mother was born in Titusville. Mm -hmm. She went to Niagara Falls when she was young. Spent a year up there with a friend and they used to come down to Titusville uh, for a hell she came south. And later on, when after my husband died, I went up and spent a, a few weeks or a month or something in the same home with the same family for a while with them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess all along, uh, there was a white community and a black community? As far as I know, uh huh. but we always had a colored person that worked for us. I called them Aunt Soren. I had an Aunt Sarah. We'd call, that's what we'd call her. And really, my father, going back and forth to Jackson, one, <laughs> oh, not to tell this, but uh, once after we'd come home, 
a colored man, Steve Smith was his name. He came down and uh, followed my father down here to try to get some work. I don't know if he ever got work, maybe so, but we had a little shanty out in the back. We called it a shanty, which was a, had been the kitchen. We moved it off the house and did some rebuilding on the house. And so we let him sleep back there, and we taught him how to read. And I can still hear him saying, I see a cat. And we, <laughs> but he'd he, he be reading way out loud at night. And, but we always had somebody working with. But they, they lived out back of Titusville a little. But uh, we never, I never did, and I don't think we did. But ever was so. Well, I don't know. I guess maybe we just didn't know, <laughs> because they were, they helpful people. But I think lots of times that a lot of them have grown up mighty healthy and everything, and. When they were slaves, they had a place to live, they had food, and uh, they had work to do. And I don't really think it was so bad them the way they start they got. But so I don't go around preaching that, and I guess I shouldn't say it on here. Well, but uh, do you remember the time of integration? That would have been in the '60s. Well, I remember I had a little girl, a colored girl, that worked for me, and. Um, she used to always, uh, not always, but every now and then she'd bring a Pittsburgh either curry or something. And it was just when they first started talking about it. And uh, she'd actually leave it behind for me to look at. <laughs> and, uh, but that was the first time that I'd really kind of waked up to what they were doing. And then I had a TV then too, and they'd be talking on there sometime. And one of the g girls that I had working f for me, she says, uh, Somebody was talking on that, and I don't know who it was. It might have been the main one. She says, what is he talking about? And I don't know if she was trying to egg me on or what it was. What is he talking about? And I didn't know any more than she did, so don't worry about that. But uh, we had an Aunt Sarah that worked right for my mother's last boy. The child was a boy that died, but we were staying up with the Packers, all of us, the kids, three of us four count me the night before so we knew mom was going to have a baby so the next morning she came up to get us and we saw her coming and we'd been picking flowers out in the Packard yard Miss Packard and uh, we saw her coming well when she said well, she wanted to go in the house and tell Miss Packard something so we started running home at about two blocks north of where we live and uh, we flew and she kept calling us to stop us. We wouldn't stop. And when we got home, then we found out the baby was dead. But we had flowers for Mama. But that was silly to tell. Yeah. It was one of my first sorrows, my little brother. <clears throat> well, much, much later in your life, a lot of things changed in our county when the space program started. Yeah. The only thing I remember is that I worked over there so long, but I can't remember. I know it changed and everything, but I don't know just what I would say was the biggest change. Uh, a lot of people came to town. Yeah, a lot of strangers. And one of the commanders that I had, and I, I've been trying to think of his name lately, and I can't think of it, but I, I found him a renting a house to rent up near where I was living in City Point. And uh, his wife and I became real friendly. And after they went out west somewhere to, after the war, well, after they left, she used to write to me all the time. And I can't remember that name. And I bet you I've got some letters that she used to write to me. And, but I was real friendly with them. OK, let's cut. We're near the end of this tape.
Interview with Margaret Abney, August 25, 1992, at 200 Carolina Avenue, Park West Condo, Winter Park, Florida. Interviewer Nancy Aseco, cameraman Robert Gilbert, camera Sony BVP50, beta SP recorder Sony BVW35, audio on channels 2 and 4. Copyright Brevard County Historical Commission, 1992, Margaret Abney, Tape 3. If I look tired, wait a minute, he's, he's yeah, gonna. I get him signal. If I look tired, it's because of Andrew, the hurricane that kept me awake all night. I'm still going to look at it tonight and pray for New Orleans. I kept awake, I listened to all of it. Good. I like hurricanes, but um, I'm kind of afraid of them. So, but that's why I look tired on account of Andrew. I guess you've seen a few hurricanes. Well, since I've lived in Florida all my life, I've seen quite a few. Watch the trees blow in the palmetto, because they, they clean house when a hurricane comes. One wild hurricane I heard about through my mother, her father, said one of the wildest hurricanes came through here, and that was early, because he came in the, right after the war between the states. He said, Everybody that saw them visited anybody up and down the coast, that's all they talked about was that hurricane. So I wish I knew the name of it. But this is Andrew that's going through now. And it's a bad one, the worst that Florida's ever seen, some folks say. And it's really doing harm in Miami now going towards New Orleans. And what did you do when the hurricane came? Uh. Well, I just sat in the house and listened and looked and worried and tried to keep everybody excited and not let them go to sleep or do anything. <laughs> and I, I really, in a way, enjoy hurricanes. I like to see them blow and blow all the palmetto fans off the tree. And, but I don't like to wake up in the morning and find a tree across the driveway and you can't get the car out of the garage and uh, water over the road. And, but I, uh, they didn't, I can't say I'm really frightened, but I might be if Andrew came around. <laughs> I don't want to see Andrew. <laughs> That's a bad one. But, um, the worst that ever happened in the house I was in was uh, it tore for a shingle or two and it leaked a little. But I was very glad when it leaked and other people wouldn't get up out of the bed and then that woke them up and they got out. But. Uh, that's about the hurricane me, but I've been through quite a few and enjoyed all of them, in a way. Mm -hmm. We have some pictures here. I thought you might be able to, <coughs> to hold them. so that we Well, this is the oldest picture I've got of right. a baseball. Okay, we're going to tilt down on that. Oh, it stopped? So we can see it. No, here we go. Okay. All right, tell us about what's in this. Now, room. I know all, I know all in fact, but I've got the names on the back of this. This is a champ of Brevard County in 1916. And I have a baseball over there on my... Is it tough? Just like that. There like that? Mm-hmm. Mm. I don't know if you can see the faces on there. No, we'll try. But I've got some names. You want me to read them? Sure. Leland T. Daniel. That's the one that turned into a dentist. Theodore Travis. Wait a minute. Albert Chalker. Lawrence Abney. Rex Solvey, I don't remember that fella. Leland uh, Hendel, Harry Forrester, Clarence, uh, Clarence Jones, oh, I knew him, Lefty Forrester, John Patterson, Carl Geiger, Leland Hatch. That's all of those. Uh, and when this was, uh, nearly all of these, when this picture was made, no, after it was made, when I got hold of it, it was deceased. I've got the year they all died. One died in 63 and one in 67. Most of them died during 67 for some reason. But that was the, uh, Blair took that picture. The champs of Brevard County. Were there other baseball teams around? Well, they had them coming up and down. That, and I used to go to baseball 
games. I liked them, and I still like baseball. I can kind of understand it. And they used to, Titusville and Coco used to play, and they just, one fellow that was uh, tongue-tied, he was hollering at him, go to it, Toto, beat that out of Titusville. <laughs> go to it, Toto. <laughs> but uh, that's a, but anyway, I, I like baseball games. And the man that I married later on in life was Lawrence Abner that's in this picture. He liked it. My first husband liked baseball too. He was on a team at the Barnett Bank in Jacksonville. I've got a little cutout in the paper where he was playing the ball. And uh, But this is just one of my old pictures. I probably want to have a reprint made of it sometime and do, but I don't want to part with that one. Okay, let's see what else. We have here. You want to? I don't know whether there's anything here that you'd be interested in or not. Uh, well, now this is a picture that I don't know the boys in here. I think I know which one is the one in there. That's uh, uh, two boys. That uh, but this is a Titusville school a long time ago. I don't even know. I'm just guessing. That's in 1904 or five, and that's in Titusville. All boys. Where are the girls? Well, I, when I looked through it, it looked like all boys, and I've got on here, where are the girls? I think I picked out my first husband, the second row, the third from the right, Parker's Brady. I think that's he was in it. He had on shoes, too. Most of those boys are barefoot. Yeah, they nearly all. But I said, uh, I wrote down here, but I think my husband had on shoes. And there was um, Pete Hall, Riles Wager. Richard Robbins, Did Rufus children? Robbins, Norris Frozier. Those are the ones I'm guessing that are in there and that I see. Did children usually go to school without shoes? Well, now, this was taken, uh, I don't know, I think they must have, because when I taught in MIMS one year, in 19, uh, right after I graduated from high school, and nearly all the children were barefooted there. And, uh, so I'll take this down. Yeah. I don't know whether you can see any of those or not, but that's good. I think some of those, those that's got coats on, I think they were the Robins. He was a lawyer, and, but uh, they are, they're all barefooted, <laughs> but, I, but I don't know. But uh, well, it looks um, like here's some of the girls, but this is a different school. Oh, that is a. Uh, oh, this is in Coco. This is a bunch of. I've got the names on here. Uh, I'm, I'm down that way at the end. Oh, I've got I can't read these names because I've got it upside down. Well, that's all right. Just hold it so we can I'll, get a, a I'll turn it upside down. Let's get a look at the picture Well, there's first. the pictures. Uh -huh. You don't have to have the names if you don't want. You can tell us where this is. That's in front of the Coco School. Uh, the Coco High School building is back there. Which one is she? Where, where are you in that picture? I'm, uh, <laughs> well, I'll put a point to it. I'm on the, when you're looking at it over there, I'm down to the left about the Second or third over, I think the third over. I just get you can just see my head. I'm down there. My sister's there somewhere. Oh, I wish I had this thing right. I would tear this off and get them right. <laughs> well, anyway. Okay, that's good. That's good enough. Mm -hmm. Virginia Myers, Dorothy Daniel, Margaret Mitchell, William, or oh, Lillian Lears, Bessie Jones, Gladys Johnson, Mary Mitchell. Margie Bryan, Katinka Myers, Estelle Canova, Lily Beal, and Lena Bracco. That's the ones in that picture. Okay. Well, you don't have to. Now, this is a picture of the boys down in Coco School in Coco, but I don't know any of the names on this one, so I don't know if it's just a bunch of bad boys and everything later in the time. It's when my children were growing up, I think. But I don't know who or what that picture was, and so I guess I'll just put it away. This is a, one of those kids, and uh, this is the picture that's in the paper, the clubhouse. And this way, I'm in the wrong place, but I don't think you need to have that. That's already been printed in the paper. And that's okay. What you got over there? Let's see. I don't know that I thought any of these would be interesting. Yeah, I think. This is on, does he want me to tell some of these names that's on the beach? Yeah, tell us who's there at the beach. Winnie Dixon, Winnie, Winnie Wells, Carrie Grant, Charles Hill, 
Charles E. Reed, Mary Reed, Nora Well, Margaret Mitchell with a hat, <laughs> Mary Mitchell, Lenita Mitchell, and then I've got a little boy with a question mark, and then Catherine Mitchell. That was over on the Cocoa Beach. How would you get to the beach? Different ways, I'm telling you. A boat, take a boat over. And then one of the interesting things that I always think about was going down to Melbourne in a boat or on to the end of the island, going across, and then getting on a, I don't know whether they called it a flatbed or what. Everybody got up on this flat thing that was on a little track, and they'd take you to the beach, and there you were at the beach. And I can remember doing that once, and that was really a trip. Because I can remember then later years when the bridge was going across, and, and when you couldn't get to Orlando from Cocoa without going down to Melbourne, go to Kissimmee. And, uh, what year was this? You got something in your eye? What year do you think this was? That one there. Uh, well, I don't know. Must have been a good while. I'm trying to see if I can. Uh, well, it was all before 19. Well, I don't know when it was. Tell the truth. I just I just haven't figured that one out. I haven't got the year written on him. But I, I was about in the eighth grade, so I was in the eighth grade, and um, well, it must have been 1915, 16, like that, 13, 16. Okay, well, let's look at that dancing picture. I'll show you that. I think that's me there, I think. Which one? I think that one right Just there. Just put your finger up. That one there is me, I think. Take it to the left? Yeah, well, right, uh, I'm what you call the right or the left. All the way on the end? No, this one here. Was with this the bonnet? With a thing around her head. It looks like a, I don't know, a ribbon or a rag or something. But that's the one next to Charlie. <laughs> what is that a picture of? He's my of? distant cousin. What are we looking at there? That's uh, that's a dancer. That's a, that's a picture of him with a, some of the people at the dance school. That she taught, and was, um, but we may not have all taken the dancing. Might have been a little, but we were there at the hall. And these are toys down here. I think they're dolls, aren't they? I think they're dolls. All right, let's cut. That was over in Indian Indian Nola. I mean, about 1912. That's all my, that was Margaret, Mary, Nita, and Catherine. And that's when we rode to sc we went down to school. And that's Gallagher, the horse. But that's when we fought the mosquitoes when we went to school from our island grove. We lived on the grove while Papa was running for clerk of the court. Is that grove on Mary Island? That's on Merritt Island, North Merritt Island. They, my mother called the Grove, uh, I better not say what the name is. <laughs> I'm trying to think, you get what I'm trying to think. Because where the land was so, was, and they've got a, into a part of buildings north and a road going down to the river, and they have an Eagle Grove. She called it Eagle Grove. And it's, uh, the street's called Eagle Street there in the North Merritt Island, way up on the island there somewhere. But right. That's Buggy? You go, that's where you go to school every Well, that was the Buggy. Well, that was, while we, well, that was when I was in the eighth grade. And uh, just for that while, we went to school in that and drove. And I drove the horse. Did you drive I did the driving, yeah. And we'd unhitch the horse at the school and uh, tie it to a tree, and then get time to come home, we'd unhitch it. it Tell us about this picture, the Dixie. This one? Mm -hmm. This is playing tennis in Titusville. That's when my father's clerk of the court. And that's the Dixie Hotel on the river. 
and uh, I think there was more posing than tennis. <laughs> <laughs> what year was that? That was, uh, well, it was sometime in the 13th or 14th or something, 15 or 16. I just don't know because my father was clerk of the court. And oh, I see. It says 1914. That is that's about what it was. Leela Willard, Leela Brown, Willard Hall, Jesse Morgan, and Mary. One is me later in the album. <laughs> Can it anyone? Okay, see you there. But this in here. Where is it? Tell us again about this picture. Oh, this is taken. This is tennis in the front of. Um, well, I said the west of the Dixie Hotel because the Dixie Hotel faced on the river. It's Mary, Jesse, Willard, and Margaret. Margaret's you, isn't it? Margaret Mitchell down here. Oh. Somebody wrote me a letter the other day. They made a piece of poem. They said, eat your heart out, Atlanta. We've got a Margaret Mitchell, too. <laughs> well, that was just lately that they did that. <laughs> a tax collector. Bullet Hall and Margaret Mitchell. And Mitchell was your maiden name. Yeah, I was Margaret. <coughs> I was Mitchell before I married. My father was Mitchell. James Fender Mitchell from Scotland. And uh, you look I, like you're having a good time. I had a grandson named Finley. He middle initial name. Finley spelled F I N L A Y, and he had a big bet with a man in Orlando that Finley and. He told my grandson, I bet your name's not spelled the same. My son, grandson said, yes, it is. They both had the L-A-Y instead of L-E-Y. But your name was Margaret Mitchell. Did people tease you, tease you about writing Bible for your name? Well, I was named Margaret Mitchell because my aunt was Margaret Mitchell, and she married Wallace. She married a Wallace. And uh, she was the one that came over early, and her husband died. And they had a little boy, so that's why my father came over here from Scotland to help her get her business settled so she could go back to Scotland. And so, so my father and Uncle Tom stayed over here, and, and neither one of them ever went back to Scotland. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm not sure if that's a hand or a forward. Can't tell, but look at that. <laughs> I need to. Did you like to drive? Uh, well, I didn't drive much because we didn't have a car. My father and I, when I was a little bit, my, <clears throat> my husband, to be had a car, and uh, I learned how to do a Ford, you know, and you turn, the, made the gears with your foot, change the gear with your foot. And when I got married, we went to Jacksonville, I learned how to shift the gears on a, a car we had, which now escapes my memory, uh, but it's a, it's a car that's still in, going along on the road. But I learned to shift the gears on the, one of the busy streets of Jacksonville, which wasn't very busy. But <laughs> cause that was in 1920 when I went up there to live in Jacksonville. See, I graduated in 1916 in Titusville. I've got my graduation thing over there. We've seen you in a boat. In, I guess that's near Titusville somewhere. Yeah, it's out there on one of the lakes back of Titusville. What do uh, they call that thing back there? Mm -hmm. Mud Hills. Lake, um, Ch I don't know, I can't say, but it's the nearest lake. When we went back there, back of Jack and Titusville somewhere. In case it interests interest anybody. Just tell us uh, what's happening in these two pictures. Let me see it, turn it around a little so I can well, see it. Well, it says, Goodbye, Jesse. Yeah, Jesse was taking, going off on the train somewhere. I don't know where she was going, but that's Jesse Morgan. She's one of the ones that graduated with me. And, uh. What train was that? What, what? What train was that? Florida East Coast Railroad. Is she heading north? That's the one that uh, had that thing in there. That I'd like to find that first thing. I'd like to see that, show that front page of that paper. 
man coming down the aisle selling bananas and fruit, you know, and they'd come down. I like the bananas. <laughs> That's when we went to Jacksonville every summer in Pueblo. That was just about the only way to get around at that time, wasn't it? That's what? That was just about the only way to travel. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And it was kind of fun. But you got it. Now I'll read you a little news. What is this? This is the Indian Rebel Advocate published. This date of this paper was May the 27th, 1898, price five cents. And I like this because it shows my first train ride. <coughs> and all the news in the town, the county, and everywhere else is on here. The Democratic Convention at Titusville and all that. It's all interesting, but I'll read this because it's my first ride on a train. And where is it? <coughs> Mr. and Mrs. E.P. Pache and family, and Mr. and Mrs. James F. Mitchell and baby of Coco passed through here Monday on their way to Jacksonville to spend some months. Mr. Poche is general manager of the Indian River and Lake Worth Pineapple Growers Association, and Mr. Mitchell is his assistant. They will now attend to all shipments of pineapples sent to Jacksonville by members of the above association. Now then, I would like to read a little article on the other side. My husband, Parker's Brady, was born, or this says birth, born to Mr. and Mrs. L.A. Brady on Sunday morning last, a son. May he live long and happily, following in the footsteps of his worthy father, who is said to be the happiest man in town. Now that was my first husband, and he died in 1929 in a car wreck, and we were married in 1920. Now then, the other little article was interesting too, but I don't think I want to read the whole paper. It's a, it's a wedding on Wednesday morning at about 11 o'clock at the residence of Mr. and Mrs. J.D. Hatter of City Point, Mr. Adam R. Brady of Titusville, and Miss Susie F. Brown of the former place were united in the holy bond of matrimony by the Reverend A.D. Penny. The ceremony was a quiet affair, only a few witnessing it, and after receiving the hearty congratulations of their friends, the newly married couple left for Titusville, where the wedding dinner was partaken of at the residence of the groom's mother, Mrs. Albine Brady. The bride and groom are well and favorably known to this section and have the best wishes of all for a long, happy, and prosperous married life in which the advocate hardly joins. Mr. and Ms. Brady are residing in the Scooby Cottage on Hopkins Street. And that's that. But the, this was brought to me by, by some boy, and I write this minute, I can't remember his name, but he wanted to find out something about Susie Brown Brady because in some way he was kin to her. But he brought me this piece of paper, which made me very happy to see it. What's the year on that? The year. Is 1898, and that was the year I was born. I was born in January. My husband was born in May, and I always worried about him being three or four months younger than I was. But he died in 1929 at the age of 31, leaving my two little sons and me alone. And so after he died, I said, I'm going to quit worrying, because I worried so just about that little bit. And now I'm 92 years old, 94 years old. I get mixed up on that birthday because all you have to do to any year is add to it, two to 1898, and that's my age. I had two to the year <laughs> because I, two years came in between. You got to be a mathematician or something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, it's 92 now. And it was two years before it got to be 90, 200, so I had two to 92, and I'm 94. <laughs>